conversation with a geographer. I'm Mike DeVivo, professor of geography at Grand Rapids Community College, and today we're very honored to have a visiting geographical scientist with us, Brittany Cook from Louisiana State University. Brittany is assistant professor of geography at LSU. Brittany, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for inviting me. You know, it's, it's, it's wonderful that you're here. You've conducted some really interesting geographical research in the Middle East. And before we get into that, um, I'll ask you, like I've asked so many others, what, what really drove your interest in exploring geography? Can you comment perhaps on your childhood, if there were any any sparks that captivated you and, and and just go on yeah it's funny that you mentioned that like immediately what pops to mind is i think it was national geographic had like an our atlas book of just all these different maps of the united states and ever since i was little that was one of my favorite books to flip through like what four-year-old is flipping through an atlas me um and so and my grandparents actually like made sure that I got that when they passed away. So it's like a really, spe like it was an important part of my mm -hmm. childhood, something that's seared into my memory. Um, and I think from there, I just, I've always been interested in different places and traveling around the world. Uh, as a kid, I never did, but I was just interested about learning about different places. Um, you know, I grew up in the DC area, so I had a lot of friends whose parents were from other parts of the world. Um, and then I went to University of Mary Washington in Fredericksburg, Virginia, which has a great geography program. It does. And an Marshall academic. Bowen did a great job in establishing that as yep. a premier bachelor's granting institution in geography. Yep. And Don Bowen is probably mm -hmm. the reason why I went to graduate is school. Is that right? Um, yeah. I wonderful. Mean, yeah, she did her, her doctorate in Canada and has mm -hmm. done wonderful work. Yeah, I mean, I had never had a class with her, but she was head of the uh, Gamma Theta Upsilon, mm -hmm. the Honor Society ch uh, chapter for Mary Washington. And she was sending out an email about who wanted to register and sign up. And I was like, well, if I'm not doing grad school, then what's the benefit? I'm a senior, like, you know, mm -hmm. most of the things I have are scholarships for graduate study and things like that. What do I want from that? And she's like, well, why don't you want to go to grad school? Like, what do I want from that? You know, I grew up in no, I'm my neither of my parents have a bachelor's, um, so I, graduate study really wasn't in my mm -hmm. in my plan. Um, and she's like, no, you can go get a master's or a PhD and have them pay for you. And she sat me down. I remember she like got the AAG directory, you mm -hmm. know, because things were still on paper. And right. <laughs> plopped it down in front of me and was like, here, flip through programs, see what professors interest you. Um, and yeah, and that's. And you had done you school. had done some study already in the Middle East while you were at Mary Wash, right? No, no. The first time I ever traveled. Um, well, I went to Cyprus, yeah. which is like, okay. you know, it's, and that's why I liked Cyprus. I mm -hmm. liked the fact that it was kind of geographically between Europe sure, and Southwest Asia. It's an ecotone of sorts between. Yeah, and it's, I love the overlapping Cyprus. history mm -hmm. of Cyprus and just how that affected culture. And so that's why I decided to study abroad there. Um, but I didn't do any formal research, but that is where I went back and did my master's research, mm -hmm. kind of from thinking about immigration issues while I was a study abroad student. Comment on, on your master's research, if you would, please, because you certainly had developed the foundation, at least, from your study abroad experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, when I was study abroad, most of my friends were international students, and so I started um, thinking about kind of the issues that migrant populate, right, whether it's students or long-term immigrants to a place kind of experience, um, and kind of how in Cyprus, as you know, there's the conflict um, between Greeks, Greek Cypriot government, I want to say, and Turkish Cypriot government, and how that's kind of uh, discussed sometimes along identity lines, and how migrants kind of come into this situation and get read in different ways. Um, and there were also it was a period of the rise of like nationalism, mm -hmm. right? So you have the, what is it, Golden Dawn in Greece. So you had Elam in Cyprus and they were doing, there were incidents of them beating up uh, refugees or migrants and uh, a lot of public debate about being an EU member and Eastern Europeans being able to freely migrate. Mm -hmm. So had all these discourses about who should be allowed to be part of Cyprus. Um, and so, yeah, so that's what inspired me to do my master's research. Um, and I was, 
interesting kind of the parallels between the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the Cypriot conflict and kind of the interconnections between um, between culturally and politically you know like I was interested to learn like the PLO printing press was in Cyprus for a little while and just these these connections well and there are certainly connections between the Levant and and and, and Cyprus in, uh -huh. in many ways well, um, w would you recommend study abroad for all geography majors I think so if you can find a way to make it work which mm -hmm. often students are like you know I can't afford that or it doesn't make sense but if you do some digging and research usually you can find some program that is the same cost or maybe even cheaper than the institution you're at um, and so yeah I think study abroad is a great opportunity especially if students go and like really get involved with either the university there or some sort of activity so they're not just going to class and hanging out with their American friends and going you know out which is all fun and good you know but uh, it's also good to be engaged in the location you're in doing some sort of project with, mm -hmm. with others so um, so you conducted your your research while you were a master's student at the mm -hmm. University of South Carolina yeah were you gaining a bit of inspiration from some of your professors there definitely I mean Amy Mills was my advisor and she was a you know why part of why I decided to go to South Carolina and I liked her like her book on um, cities and neighborhood in Istanbul mm -hmm. and just this like cultural landscape approach and and really you know thinking intimately about urban space um, and yeah and, and she ha had these long-standing relationships at where she did her research and so that was kind of I admired that model and kind of wanted to emulate that um, and she was a really also her advising style kind of inspired me as I um, go on to be an advisor just someone who's like really supportive and kind of meets you where you are and helps focus on what skills you need to work on um, yeah she was really uh, direct but patient and kind with all of the constructive criticism she gave me along the way. Patience and kindness is something we can all use. Yeah, definitely, you know, definitely. But but if it's our task to uh, mentor our students, patience and kindness goes a long way. Because when I think back about the research I wanted to do, and like even how I was thinking about it at the time, like to me now I'd be like, wow, there are so many other ways you could go about that project, you know. But but she was just very encouraging and I think that's that's a great way to approach advising so that's wonderful and then from uh, Columbia South Carolina you decided to go to Kentucky yes um, and again I end up with an or not I intentionally chose Anna Secor as my advisor again another feminist political geographer mm -hmm. Uh, whose work I really was interested in, interested in ways of thinking about the political, like the big po global political questions, but looking at them in like everyday spaces and relationships between people. Um, yeah, and it just turns out that I had two people who work in Turkey and I have, don't, <laughs> but two fabulous scholars um, mm -hmm. on Southwest or South, yeah, Southwest Asian geographies in general. That, that's interesting. Many many people don't really realize how how distinguished the program at the University of Kentucky is now. That I think is to a large degree resp uh, sparked by, by by Stan Brun's responsibilities and leadership. He really he really created I think a, a program that would be considered in the top ten if there was a ranking today, and. Um, and it's 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 really it's really a, a program of distinction. Uh, who who else inspired you there? Who else did you work with? Well, as you're saying that too, for me, one of the kind of thinking about the history of the department as I've learned about it is thinking about Sue Roberts coming mm -hmm. into the department and how she and others pushed like to gain legitimacy as women in geography and how difficult that was and talking with Anna about being in political geography mm -hmm. when she started and pushing for feminist political geography like these are to me okay it's the norm and it's accepted but I think um, you know my uh, my mentors right had to make that way for for the next generation of geographers so thinking about um, all of the wonderful feminist scholars that I know and have gotten the pleasure to work with like they put in real dirty work to like make space for that um, yeah well I, I, I get the impression that the generation before you 
of, uh, of feminist geographers really, really developed quite a credible body of qualitative research that mm -hmm. was far too often ignored mm -hmm. in, in, in our discipline. And that, um, that, that scholarship has benefited all, not just your generation of women geographers, but, but many in the field. Talk a little bit about your dissertation. It's a little unusual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, my dissert, you know, I like to show this image when I'm talking to students about field work and research about how you have this plan. It's like a picture of someone riding a bike on a nice straight path, but then your actual how research goes has all these twists and turns and ups and downs. Um, my original plan was to do research um, in Palestine on, well, that was my original <laughs> intention. I actually went and worked with an organization for a while doing community mapping workshops and I became interested in um, olive oil production as also not only an economic activity but a political activity. And where were you I was doing based this in Jerusalem. Day. But you were going um, But where? I was going to Janine, Nablus and in places. Janine and, and Nablus, mm -hmm. okay. In the West Bank um, on, my, on my free time. And so then when I came back to Kentucky, I was like, OK, like there's this fair trade organic production. It's really interesting. Um, and all this activism around the olive harvest and activists from, from Israeli communities, from Palestinian communities, from international communities coming and helping farmers pick olives because um, to help protect against uh, sometimes violent violence that happens from neighboring settlements mm -hmm. during the harvest. There have been incidents where settlers have come and attacked farmers as they're harvesting. And also just the logistics of having to sometimes get military permits to sure. access your olive orchards. Um, it has required, it puts stress on farmers. You know, they can't pick their harvest exactly when they want to. It's when they get the security. Well, and there's so many different microclimates that can, um, that can spark differences in the harvest time and right. a lot of it is associated with that corrugated landscape. Right, right, yeah. And then you also mix that with just it's labor intensive, mm -hmm. right? And you need lots of people to come help. It's usually a very social thing. Families go out picnic and you just the several months of the olive harvest you go and, and pick. Uh, but needing to get that permit kind of puts you on mm -hmm. that time crunch you need. So there's a lot of uh, political solidarity action happening during that time. So I thought this was what my dissertation was going to be. Came back, wrote my proposal, got it approved. And then I saw the Fulbright US student program and I was like, oh, this could be a really interesting comparative project. So I'd heard about organic olive oil production in Jordan and to kind of get a sense of how the occupation shapes it and what commonalities they have between the two countries beyond that. Um, and yeah, and so I got the Fulbright and went to Jordan. And once I started digging in and talking with people, I was like, no, I want to spend all of the time I have to do dissertation research here. I felt like I would be too split between the two places trying to do a comparative study in the time frame that you have for a dissertation. So yeah, so that's how I, I got to Jordan and began doing the work there. As, as you reflect upon this, was your uh, field work in uh, Jordan somewhat less stressful because of the absence of occupation? Um, yes and no, right? I mean, there's different stresses. Right. Um, You know, the day to day, you know, when people ask me, did you like living in Jerusalem? Like Jerusalem's an amazing city mm -hmm. and it's, it's the beautiful. history, it's beautiful. Oh. The history is amazing, but there's also that daily stress of living with the active occupation. For me, it's like less than most of the people I'm around, sure. right? I, I'm an outsider, so I can navigate it easier than, than a lot of folks, but um, still just the day to days of seeing who will take you home to your house, right? Like getting a taxi and if they'll take you, if you live in a Palestinian neighborhood, will they take you there or not? Those things are, are stressful and taxing or um, ID checks, uh, protests, mm -hmm. those sorts of things. Um, you know, the, um, when the occupation uh, is, is, is visible, right? Uh, it can be quite stressful. Um, and Jordan, 
doesn't have that, but you st it's still stressful to do field work. Like it's exciting, but also stressful, like trying to make new connections, right? I had spent time six months in, in Jerusalem, and in that short amount of time, I'd gotten a fairly good lay of the land about who the actors were in certain political circles and things. So I had a lot of relearning to do about like, okay, what does this look like here in Jordan? Um, so yeah, so that answer, <laughs> it's a yes or a no, right? I can't give a black and white answer. <laughs> That's okay. It's always, yeah, these nuances. Because, because field work is complicated. It's right. not, there, there's no easy answer to conducting this kind of qualitative research. Right, and I kind of went in with this idea of like, oh, I'll find my like, my activisty people who will really love my research topic and like, and we'll, you know, we'll do this collaborative thing. It didn't quite end up like that. Like my form of collaboration ended up more working with people on grant writing or teaching English classes, which gave me insights that are incorporated into the, the research, but it's not the kind of collaborative project from start to finish that I kind of uh, hoped for. Mm -hmm. But you develop close relations then with, with the community in Jordan. Definitely. And, um, would, would you care to comment on some of the challenges that faced you in terms of your research, especially associated with those that were involved in the production? Yeah, uh, I mean, language is a challenge, right? I was still, I mean, I'm still, my language skills are always evolving. Um, and so that was one challenge. Um, but, you know, when I voiced my anxieties about this to my advisor, being like, oh, well, you know, I'm doing this research in a place where I'm not completely fluent, she kind of spun it, was like, you have the capability to understand things, but you also have enough distance where you need a little extra help, and so that gives people space to also hold what they want private and share with you, and so I always kind of held that in the back of my head as like, okay, like, you can do this, and it's, you know, it'll work out. Um, so, so, yeah, so working with communities challenges. Um, and then, you know, as a woman doing research by myself and especially yes. wanting to do it in rural areas, mm -hmm. I had to be really careful about how I went about that. Um, and I was a grad student. I didn't have resources to like buy a car so I could, you know, so I was taking buses, these small rural buses between different villages. And I can remember one time I had an interview set up with someone um, and they made a comment that was kind of flirtatious. And so I called a friend immediately. I was like, hey, can you come with me on my next interview tomorrow so that, uh, so just to be safe. And so I have, um, I'm not going into this place by myself in a kind of rural area. And, and when we went as two people to interview this person, he was, he could, my friend was shocked. He was like, this person said that thing to you yesterday? I'm like, yeah, yeah, this is, this is what happens. She's like, I can't, the way he was today, I can't imagine him saying that. Like, yeah. Um, on the whole, I, you know, it was fine and I built lots of great relationships. I think there was only that instance and a small, you know, a couple of small things where I felt uncomfortable, but you just had to be conscious of it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think you have to be, like that, I would be like that in Louisiana or where I live or anywhere. But when you're in field work, you're really trying to make connections with as many people as possible and accommodate them and find spaces where you can talk. And so I think it pushes you beyond your boundaries more so than when you're at home, right? Where I, at home, I, I kind of know the lay of the land or I can be, you know, in my day to day, I don't have to worry about putting myself in spaces that, um, that might be a little precarious sure. potentially. But but by the same token, as a woman, I would suspect you could mm -hmm. gain deeper insight from, from women in the community because they may be, be able to uh, find you more trustworthy. And also, you, a, a man couldn't connect in the same way you could. Yeah, and I, I, people have written about this um, in, in doing field work and, you know, um, especially in, in some families, you know, spaces are very divided between women and men. And, you know, if I go to a house, um, or if I, were to, if I were male and I went to a house to interview someone, 
uh, in some households, the women really wouldn't be interacting with me much, right? Um, but as a woman, I can enter those same spaces and kind of see the behind the scenes, go in the kitchen, talk with folks, go, you know, I have more free, free range in, in, a, in a private space um, in a lot of communities. You know, each, each house is different um, and what, how families negotiate those ba gendered roles and boundaries of space. But um, I certainly have access that male colleagues wouldn't have. And on the flip side, it also makes it difficult when I'm doing things like going to Olive Mills or one time I really wanted to pick olives on a farm and at first they're like, yeah, we'll set you up, da 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 da, it'll be great. And then they're like, you know what, all the male laborers there are, are, are men. They're like, I really don't think it's a good idea. And you know, no, we're not gonna set this up. And I was like, okay. You know, so where if I were a male colleague, sure, I would have been like out there mm -hmm. um, hanging out with, with people picking the olives in that circumstance, right? Because they were not families, but a group of mostly male laborers. Do you have some advice that you can offer to uh, a female graduate student who's mm -hmm. considering conducting field work in the, in the Middle East? Any, are, are, are there one, two, three things that you can offer that you would have liked to have known before you, you conducted your field work? That, um, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think like, in general and as well as, as specific to the region. I mean, Arabic dialects present an is interesting um, challenge because you, know, you get training in the US often in like in, in formal Arabic and then the dialects vary widely, you know? I, I felt really proud of myself, you know, I did this like intensive program uh, where I had to speak Arabic 24 seven and lived with my instructors before I did my PhD research mm -hmm. and then I go to Jerusalem and I work in this organization and I don't understand the simple words that people are saying right because colloquial words differ so widely so many idioms yeah but even words for like what are different mm -hmm. between formal you know the basic mm -hmm. everyday words you're using in almost every sentence but when we switched to politics I understood more right because I was familiar with like the language of the news and that vocabulary which is a symptom of like how Arabic is thought about in the US but um but that said, you know, I spent time taking specifically colloquial lessons when sh once I was in Jerusalem. And so really investing that time and money in focusing on learning dialects. And I would get pushback from people being like, well, you know, that's not formal Arabic. You need to still work on the, on the formal and get those skills up. But it was really important to do both side by side mm -hmm. for me. Um, and then also acknowledging that research assistants, like using research assistants in the field can be really useful in terms of how they come at it from a different perspective and like just the cultural insights that they can kind of unfold that you might not see while you're doing interviews because um, how you refer to things matters what words you use right and now sometimes when I do interviews the words I can choose to use right about specific agricultural products or foods signals to people that I, I know some things, right, that I'm not completely oblivious. So they can go into more detail. So using research assistants can really be valuable on multiple levels. Um, Male or female or both? I've, I've worked with both, right? Um, but when I did the work with women's uh, organizations and businesses, I used um, someone who was female, right? And, and that worked well so that we could go in those spaces and people were um, presumably maybe more comfortable. Um, and then when I was doing more work in rural villages, kind of with farms, I used male research mm -hmm. assistants. So that was another thing that helped me kind of navigate those gender boundaries differently. Definitely. So the research assistants <laughs> can be key and, um, the Fulbright did not cover them. You had to pay for them yourself. Um, well I had other, I was you know, blessed to get other grants as well. And so they were funded mostly okay. from, from that's grant wonderful. money. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's um, important for, for uh, 
graduate students to know that they can get that funding for research assistance. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's like I just applied to so mm -hmm. many different funding resources, small and large. And I think that's another important thing of being a graduate student is just, you know, learning how to tailor your basic template to these different sure. agencies that want um, that have grants available to be able to use those resources. Well, and, and again, the, the, the notion of, of using research assistance is very important. And I think as, um, as geographers, we've often taken on the burden of conducting the entire piece of scholarship ourselves. Mm -hmm. we've, been, we've been tasked with this notion of this being an entirely independent endeavor and yet uh, you know in in Barnes recent staple security she comments on the high value of a research mm -hmm. assistant and that, that and her so important the book is a great example of how you can be more collaborative with your research mm -hmm. assistants or people who are working with you right and I think there's been a lot of really valid critique about the ethics of using research assistants and how you know you just have to approach it in a way that is ethical and like and sometimes they can you, people write articles you don't even know that they used research assistance right um, but they're they're members of your research team they are shaping this project it would not turn out the same way if you didn't have them by your side and it should be written accordingly um, and I, that's why I really one of the things I really enjoyed about Jessica Barnes's newest book is she has that whole chapter that's um, the research assistant either wrote by herself or had an instrumental part in writing. Um, so yeah, so I thought that was a great, an essential way of kind of approaching this. And mm -hmm. that, you know, with one of my research assistants, I was like, are you interested in co-publishing? She's like, I don't, you know, and that's another aspect is um, not everyone's interested in the, in the outputs that academics are gonna be invested in, right? But maybe finding alternative outputs that you can co-create uh, could be valuable. Mm -hmm. So thinking about how that labor can, you can help uh, your research assistant find a way to make it beneficial to them in their career development. Well, and, and you you recently had an article associated with empowering women. Mm -hmm. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, because the, that, that, that your, your findings are very interesting. Yeah, it was a really challenging article to write as far as tone, right? Because I'm being critical of the idea of empowerment, but I don't want to say that I don't want to empower women, right? Like there's a difference between empowerment being utilized as a, as a, I don't know, as an, as a utilitarian concept in development versus the actual every day of how people feel empowered on a personal level. And they overlap, they're not mutually exclusive. And development agencies have, you know, helped many women feel personally empowered. And I don't want to minimize that at all. But I think there's room to be critical of the assumptions that that utilization of the term empowerment can bring along with it, you know? Um, whether it's kind of the checkboxy things where, okay, we'll train this many women to do this. And like, check, we did that. We have another know? number, there we go. Right, exactly. Or the statistic of women in the workforce, you know, where I'm at the same time having conversations with women about like, oh my gosh, I'm so stressed between taking care of the family and having to work. Or like, the economic situation is really bad right now and I have to work to help support my family. And so to hear it then in the development circles always be lauded as this great thing, like more women are in the workforce. I'm like, but wait, people are talking about how it's due to stress sometimes, not just because they want mm -hmm. to, right? Um, and so I just wanted to put a little nuance out there about how empowerment uh, can be sometimes approached by development agencies and how sometimes it doesn't really reflect in the women's experiences, or it can be because of other factors, right? The cultural landscape is complicated. Right. There are no easy answers no. to solving problems, usually. Yeah. And some of those problems may take a long time, usually take a long time to, to tackle right. in and an effective manner. And cultural landscapes aren't you know, they aren't static and they're always changing. And so people are adjusting to these dynamics, right? Global economic pressures. And, and, and so it's all, I find it challenging to write about because I'm always trying to be like really 
as an out, you know, outsider being like, okay, where are my limits of like what I can say and what I shouldn't say, right? What are like my assumptions as an outsider? And yeah, I just find it really um, difficult sometimes to parse that out. I challenge my, I should say, I challenge myself to kind of really think carefully about parsing those boundaries. Um, but I think it's necessary to kind of call attention because development it, development organizations do have these global spans and have large impacts in a lot of communities. So I think the more detailed case studies we can have about how different programs impact people will give us that more nuanced vision of how these things are happening. Um, yeah. Well, the nuances that we see are essentially the rules of life in many individual places. There's not a one-size-fits-all model that we can employ everywhere. Because right. the world is complicated. Yeah, well. and I think one thing that I loved about geography was this kind of thinking across scales and thinking you know, about how these global processes kind of take hold in, 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 on individual, even you know, a lot of feminist work focuses on the body. And, sure. Um, yeah, I just, that's, that's part of what got me into geography. Other disciplines do it, but like, it's been geography's bread and butter for a long time, so. That's, um. that's, that's wonderful to hear. <laughs> and, and, and with about a minute to go here, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you to, to think about that as geography is your bread and butter, mm -hmm. our bread and butter mm -hmm. in a sense. <laughs> um, I'll ask you to reflect on, on your journey and where you're going. And if you can provide any insight or advice to aspiring geographers, especially especially women in geography, but also colleagues. Here you are at, at a PhD granting department that has a, a stellar history. It's it's certainly distinguished. Um, you've come you've come a very long way in a very short period of time. Yeah. And, yeah. and your, your, your path to success so far is remarkable. Can you offer some pearls of wisdom or some advice? Well, I mean, I think about it when to people who are thinking about pursuing a PhD in geography, you know, I, I'm, I'm a utilitarian thinker a lot of times. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, you know, you don't know what's going to happen after the PhD. Right, the academic job market is finicky and it's hard to sometimes get a job where you want mm -hmm. to be. But if you're okay with the financial constraints of like living on a grad student budget for a few years, the ability to dedicate your time to research something that you're really interested in is, is an amazing experience. And even if you don't go into academia, you can, if you strategically think about your project and the impacts you want to have outside the academy, then you can do some really awesome work and it doesn't matter where you get a job or you're opening your opportunities or your, you know, your potential career paths wider. Um, and so, yeah, so I think having that realis realistic expectations about what grad school will set up for you, but if you're able to do it, um, it can be really rewarding. Well, being realistic about the possible outcomes is certainly important, but doing geography is a rewarding career for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Brittany, for spending time with us today. It's been a wonderful chat. Thank you. Thank you. And this concludes uh, this episode of Conversation with a Geographer. Thank you.